Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Sullivan. I happen to be the RVP for Conducive Technology and, and handle our customers and business in the uh, eastern region. And I'd like to welcome you all today to our webinar is around our Velocity IO reduction software where folks are seeing 2x faster SQL performance uh, just by using our patented IO reduction software. So very excited to be sharing with you the good news of Velocity today and, and how it benefits SQL and quite frankly benefits all uh, Windows-based applications. Um, and we've spared uh, no expense today uh, to bring in a special guest star for the webinar. Uh, joining me when, and also keeping me honest as the sales guy is our Senior Vice President of Technology Strategy, Gary Kwan, otherwise known as GQ. GQ, you out there? I'm here, Dan, and don't let those initials fool you. It's just easy to remember you by. I'm a techie. I'm in jeans and T-shirt. But don't let Dan <laughs> fool you either. He, although he's a marketing guy, he, he knows his tech, too. But uh, with both of us, we should be able to answer and uh, present all the data to you. Now, one thing, Dan, I, I do like to say is we do like to make this very interactive. So you'll see a Q&A box on the right-hand side over there. So during the session or afterwards, uh, go ahead and type any questions you want and type them to all presenters so we can all see it. Now, don't do it on the chat box. Do it on the Q&A. And uh, we really enjoy uh, that interaction. So thanks, Dan. Oh, thank you, GQ. Um, and folks, as he mentioned, uh, you know, we've had some great interaction uh, on these webinars uh, with great questions, and, and no question is a bad one. So please take the opportunity uh, to ask, while, especially while we have GQ here. Uh, in addition to that, uh, for those of you that, that hang, with, hang with us here through the webinar, uh, you'll be receiving after this a not-for-resale copy, NFR copy, of our Velocity 7 server license. So you'll be able to run uh, Velocity, what you're going to be seeing here, in your own environment to test. It's a $525 MSRP value, uh, but we're excited to have you join us here today and also have you try it in your, uh, in your different environments. So thanks very much um, for that. Folks, uh, you may or may not be familiar with Conducive Technologies, but most probably you're familiar with a previous product and company name that we had, which was the Disk Keeper Corporation. So as, as you may think, we've been in business over uh, 37 years. And GQ, by the way, how long have you been with us? Just, ab just about that same time, Dan. So I've been a long timer here, mainly in the R&D area. <laughs> That's awesome. He joined us when he was in single digits, by the way, folks. <laughs> but uh, Disk Keeper was the preeminent disk defragmentation software. We sold over 100 million copies worldwide. But as you all know, back in 2012, the world is turned upside down with virtualization. Uh, and then we, too, changed our name from Disk Keeper to Conducive Technologies because GQ and his team respun our software, so no longer are we the defragmentation software that we used to be. You do not uh, defrag a SAN or an SSD. So, th but they uh, quite handily respun our software to where we now actually prevent fragmentation from occurring in the Windows OS, and GQ will talk a little bit more about that later. So that, in addition to a patented caching engine that uses idle DRAM to cache hot reads, a very intelligent, very smart uh, patented caching engine. The two of those reduce anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of I.O. moving to your back-end storage subsystem. And as a result of that reduction, our customers are seeing anywhere from 50 to 300 percent application performance improvement on existing hardware even on an all-flash environment, and I'll share that with you a little bit later in the presentation. So phenomenal performance improvements through this, this dramatic I.O. reduction. Because of it, Gartner named us a cool vendor and said we should be installed in every virtualized initiative. 
The caching engine that I mentioned is so dynamic and so intelligent that folks that you see there like Samsung, HP, Dell, Lenovo, Western Digital, and others actually OEM that caching engine from us and they put it in their workstations and, and laptops uh, under their own name. Again, they have their own caching engines, but what GQ and his team developed, they're so intelligent and so efficient that it's better than what they have, and they use it day in and day out. And you can imagine the testing that they put that through before they put their own name on it. For all of the work we've done over the decades in the Microsoft area, we're a close partner with Microsoft, because of what we do in virtualization, we're a close partner with VMware. And most recently, GQ and his team uh, were able to qualify and pass through the needle in the Microsoft SQL Server I.O. reliability certification. GQ, you want to chat about that for a minute? Sure, Dan, and thanks. Uh, I consider this a nice elite certification here. Microsoft has these sort of levels to make sure that Third-party applications like ourselves are fully compatible and reliability with their products, and in this case, SQL Server. Uh, not only did we have to go through strange testing, we also had to go uh, face a board of Microsoft SQL experts and answer all their questions. So uh, one of the things that is special about this is we're the first and only software vendor to get this certification, Dan. But uh, we're a good company with other hardware vendors like EMC, Dell, and HP that also get, have it too. So a very nice accolade uh, for our software here, Dan. Yeah, congratulations, GQ, uh, to you and your team. And, and by the way, folks, um, GQ and his team certified using Azure instances. So not only do we run on-premise, but we also optimize I.O. in the cloud, and we can talk about that later uh, also. So that's really all I'm going to spend on, on the company and our background to give you a little street cred. You know, we're talking about SQL and SQL performance. Um, we've done study after study, year after year, with, I, with IT professionals. Over 1,000 folks we survey on a yearly basis. And every year, SQL has popped up as one of those applications that is really bothersome and where they see sluggish performance. This year happened to be 28% of the folks uh, that we surveyed saw that, and that was up from last year, which was up from the year before. So SQL certainly is an area to focus on and one where you'll see we do incredibly well for you on. Believe it or not, seven of our 10 new customers buy us to help improve SQL performance. And while, again, we, we optimize across all Windows environments, uh, file servers, domain controllers, SharePoint, Exchange, Oracle on Windows, et cetera, SQL is the number one uh, application that folks are using our uh, patented software to help improve performance. You know, virtualization has been great for server efficiency, but it's been horrendous for I.O. performance. What you'd like to see in a perfect world are these large contiguous writes emanating out of the Windows OS, hitting the hypervisor, moving down to storage, and back again. Most efficient I.O. stream possible. But what happens in virtualization are these two inefficiencies creep in and create havoc with I.O. and therefore with performance. One is the Windows I.O. tax, and two is the I.O. blender effect. And GQ, you want to chat about what those, how they improve perform, how they impact performance? Be glad to, Dan. And, you know, uh, Dan calls this the Windows I.O. tax. And what this is is uh, this is happening on your uh, virtual machines or physical machines, too, uh, running the Windows platform. The Windows file system takes a one-size-fits-all approach when trying to write out data. It doesn't know that, you know, when a file gets created or extended, how big it's going to be. So what it does is it just basically looks for the next allocation. Well, that next allocation, and this is all on the, on the, uh, the physical, the client side here, if the data can't fit in that allocation, it has to go find another allocation. 
which is another I.O., and so forth and so forth. So rather than writing that data all in a single I.O., it gets put out as a whole bunch of random I.O. Now, uh, if you ever look at benchmarks from storage, they give you two benchmarks, one for sequential I.O. and one for random I.O. And you'll notice that sequential I.O. always outperform the random I.O. So not only are we optimizing the I.O.s here going through the stream of the bandwidth, we're, still, we're also optimizing the storage itself because you're getting the most out of it. But that's just at the Windows I.O. tax. Now you look at the hypervisor. You've got multiple VMs, and they're all pushing down these small random IOs. And we, 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 coin, we coined this term with uh, Gartner here called the IO blender effect. Now you have all these random IOs, and they have to try to satisfy them from all these different machines, and they get all mixed up. And that also degrades performance, too. So you have these two effects. And we're going to talk later on how we and how our software optimizes the I.O. to get rid of that. So thanks, Dan. Sure, GQ. Thanks for that explanation. So folks, for example, if you're writing a gigabyte of data here, it might take 100,000 I.O.s to do that. With our optimization software, it might take only 50 or 60,000. So you can appreciate just how much faster something's going to go if you're almost up to half of what it would be if it looked like this. And by the way, if you really care to and you want to Google the I.O. Blender effect and the definition by Gartner, it talks about degrading storage performance and increasing latency. So, and this happens in every virtualized environment. It's nothing that, that you or I or anyone else does. And it doesn't matter what type of storage back end you have here. Hyperconverged, all flash, a mixture, et cetera, it all has to deal with this extremely chaotic I.O., which degrades performance. So, folks, I mentioned we were two light filter drivers, and where do we sit? So we're, we install in the Windows OS. So we're above everything in your environment. If it's compatible with Windows, it's compatible with us. So any of the hypervisors, servers, HBAs, networks, storage, et cetera, doesn't matter because we're, as, as GQ mentioned, we're doing our optimization up in the OS or helping Windows optimize in the OS and also using idle DRAM to cache those reads. And it's not the big blobs of data that we're looking to cache. It's all of those small, noisy, random I.O. that Windows generates that are unnecessary and create performance bottlenecks. So trying to at least give you a sense here of, of where it is we sit. And again, we install in the VM uh, in both, uh, you know, in physical machine or in a virtual environment. So as we mentioned before, we were going to get more rights for every I.O. Uh, contiguous, as get, and as GQ said, it's much more advantageous to the storage environment to see that. We're using our patented DRAM caching engine to cache hot reads. They don't take the trip down to storage and back again. We have a benefits dashboard that will show you that actually demonstrates and shows you in your environment specific to you what's happening, how many IOs are being saved, read, write IOs being saved, the subsequent time, storage time saved because of that I.O., et cetera. And we do guarantee to solve your toughest performance problems or your money back. So with that, we really, as I mentioned, were two patented filter drivers, one called IntelliRite. And GQ, I'll let you chat a little bit about IntelliRite. Thanks, Dan. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier how uh, the file system doesn't know when a file gets created or extended how big it's going to be, so it doesn't know uh, to try to find the best allocation. Well, what we are doing here is in the background, we're monitoring your system to see how these writes and extensions are occurring. So we know when a certain application or a certain file type, when it gets created or extended, how big it's going to be. And we just feed that intelligence 
back to the file system. So the Windows file system can now find the best allocation so it can do that right in a nice contiguous manner. Of course, now that it can do that, does it right in a nice contiguous manner, then it will read it back in that same nice contiguous manner. And, you know, I, I like to do this analogy here, Dan. Uh, if you're going to carry a gallon of water from one location to another, do you do it with 100 small Dixie cups or do you do it with one big gallon bucket? And that's what we're helping the file system do. Let's, let me let it write it in a nice, optimized manner. So thanks, Dan. No, that, that's great, GQ, and a great analogy. I appreciate that. So the second patented uh, is the IntelliMemory. As I mentioned, it uses idle and available DRAM to cache hot reads uh, in your server. GQ, you want to chat about that, please? Sure. And, you know, there's two, you know, caching is not new, but we're very unique. And, and as you indicated, Dan, nine out of the top ten OEM PC manufacturers license our technology, as well as some storage vendors like Western Digital and SanDisk. And the reason why is these two things. One is, you know, normal caching products, sometimes you have to go and allocate how much memory you want to use here. Uh, we don't do that. We, we will dynamically use what memory is available and not being used by the system. So, you know, it's, since it's not being used by, by the system, we'll take it and get that performance from it. Now, if any user or system process needs it, we automatically give it up so there's never any uh, memory contention issue. The second uniqueness about us is how we decide what to put and keep in cache. Uh, many caching products uh, look at what was just read and says, oh, let me put that in cache and hope that that gets read in uh, again so I can cache it. We're doing something a little bit different. We're actually, uh, one, monitoring your system, seeing what data is getting read and what, is, what data is getting read in uh, many times. So those are the you know data that we want to put in cache because we know will get hit more. Now the se second thing, and you, you went into this a little bit, Dan, is we, we kind of weigh the data and say which one will give you the best performance gains. You know, the, the nice large contiguous reads don't hurt as much as all these small random reads. And we know those will hurt performance more, those nice small busy reads. So we'll weigh those and factor those in on what to put in cash. And as you indicate, Dan, we're right there at the machine level, right where the application is creating the IOs. So if we can cache it right there, we just save that IOs from having to go down to the network and because we satisfy it right there. So not only do we speed up completing that IO, we just improved uh, you know, improve the bandwidth of network of other VMs going to that storage too because there's less traffic on it. So uh, that's, those are the main features of our caching uh, technology, Dan. No, thanks, GQ. And, and again, folks, I hope you, you picked up at how unique it is. And there's nothing for you to do to have all of that occur in your environment. We are truly, and we, and we trademark years ago, we are truly set it and forget it software. So we beat the Ronco chicken guy to that. You just install us, and now with our latest releases, GQ and his team have been working for years on this. There's no reboot required to install us in the OS. I had a customer last week tell me, that, geez, I've even got to reboot my server to install a print driver. So no longer to get all of this capability do you have to reboot your server. It takes minutes to install. The longest time it takes is to download the software. It installs in minutes, and it starts optimizing immediately. And you'll see results in two to three days, especially as the caching engine begins to learn the different applications. 
really pretty amazing what GQ and his team have accomplished. I took a few examples of customers' of results that are, these, these are on our website, and I'm not going to spend time going through these, but not only do you get improved performance from our software, but because of the I.O. reduction, you're able to add more applications to your existing environment without having to add existing hardware, or you could extend the life of your existing hardware longer than you may have planned for because of what it is we're able to provide for you. Krista's Health. They were able to defer a $2 million PO they were about to issue for a storage upgrade after installing Velocity, getting the performance improvements they needed, and that was deferred for a couple of years, folks. And they, by the way, they have us now on 2,500 servers, over 2,500 servers. They're the largest health, one of the largest healthcare institutions in the state of Texas. Bell Mobility, lower left there, they're the Verizon of Canada. Look at that. They installed our software, it takes minutes, and it reduced I.O. to their SAN by 61%, and they got 3x faster SQL queries. You know, incredible results. Look at ASL marketing in the middle. SQL batch imports dropped from 27 hours to 12 hours, a 15-hour reduction, and the list goes on. A few more examples here, and I'll just even, oh, you can read them all. I'll just share with you the top one, University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, 50,000 students were installed in their facilities and services group. Uh, they had used Disk Keeper in the past. They learned about Velocity. They had just upgraded their environment. A, they manage all the work orders for the, uh, for the university, all the card swipes of the 50,000 students and teachers in the, in the bookstore, dormitories, food halls, et cetera. Uh, and they run some different database applications against that. So they installed Velocity. They had also just upgraded their whole environment to all brand new servers, a lot of memory, and, and brand new flash storage. So with that new environment, these database applications took four and a half hours to run, and they processed 13.9 million IOs to do that. 72 hours later, after installing Velocity in their environment, look at this. It, instead of four and a half hours, it took one and a half hours, and we processed 2.7 million IOs versus 13.9 million, and in that one and a half hours, we processed another half a terabyte of data. I mean, unbelievable uh, results here, and Greg Landis, the director of IT, as I told him, this is great, we can sweat these new assets longer, he kind of looked at me and said, yeah, I can do that, but what you've allowed me to do, because I've spent all my money, in upgrading this environment is to, pre is to add more applications because of all of this headroom we've given him in, from reducing all that I.O. without having to add more expensive hardware. So incredible stories from all of these folks, and again, there are more, even more on our website. But again, we really you know, want to see and hope you'll see the same results in your environment. I mentioned the real-time dashboard to show you exactly what it is the software is doing for you. This is just one of several screens that are presented to you in your environment around what it is we're doing. So what you'll see is the number of IOs being eliminated. We'll calculate the number of read and write IOs eliminated and, their, and the percentages uh, that's being eliminated. And, uh, and again, developed by GQ and his team, uh, those IOs that are being eliminated are then calculated against your average latencies, and we actually then give you a storage IO time saved, which is a result of all of these IOs being eliminated in your environment. And folks, we actually, we have customers that have billions of IOs being eliminated and days upon days of storage IO time being saved because the IOs are being eliminated or cached at the server. In addition, fragments prevented and eliminated, free space is consolidated, and there are multiple other tabs that, you, that give you additional information. Very, very uh, great information about your I.O. environment, something that maybe most people don't even think about all the time. So how do you guarantee 2x faster SQL performance? First, add more DRAM if possible. If there's not enough available, adding additional DRAM will allow us to use that, use that idle DRAM to cache those reads. DRAM is 10 to 15 times faster than flash or anything on the planet. 
So having available DRAM can really benefit the environment. Also, Microsoft best practice is to cap SQL's max memory, to leave additional memory for the OS and for us to use. And you can monitor the dashboards to see the results that you're getting. You know, and if we aren't getting 30 to 50 percent, potentially adding a little more memory will get you to those kind of numbers. GQ, did I miss anything here? No, Dan, I think you got it, and I just do want to stress this. And Jared actually had a question on this, and he pointed it out that, you know, SQL is not very smart on how it uses memory. What it tends to do is just as it it's tries to load all its databases in memory, even though some of those databases aren't getting access or parts of those databases aren't getting access. So just by limiting the amount of memory that SQL uses so we could use some, you'll see improved performance. In fact, uh, there was in the past there was an uh, outside lab that did some testing, and by giving us uh, it was somewhere of four to six gigabytes of memory, uh, the transaction rate went up by about 60 percent uh, because of us being able to use that memory for caching uh, and optimize the I/O reduction, Dan. So uh, amazing. That, yep. yep. It truly is, and the results our customers are seeing, as I hope you saw before, are, are truly significant. So thanks, GQ. Um, I know we'll get to some of the questions here. Just wanted to cover really what, what kind of the next steps are for you. First, as I mentioned, you're going to get a not-for-resale copy of a Velocity server license. So just download it. As, as we said, again, no, no reboot required to install. Install it, let it run for at least 24 hours so the caching engine and others can kind of adjust for your workloads and applications, and then pull up the dashboard to see, you know, what's, what's happening in your environment. We also recommend that you put us on all of the VMs on a host. Uh, you may, you know, you may just put us on one of the most, uh, most taxing VM that you have, but all of the other VMs are also creating all of those random I.O. That, that GQ talked about earlier. And while we could optimize one quite significantly, the others with all of the other noisy I.O. could actually, you know, degrade the improvements we're making on that one VM. So we're actually happy to work with you and also let you try a 30-day free trial of our host base license. So you could install in all the VMs and realize the benefits across, you know, a, a host environment. So, uh, you know, with that, uh, GQ, you want to jump? Do we have a few questions out there? Dan, we got a good group here. There's some great nice. questions out there. Uh, so, well, yeah, let's get started on this. I see Lee, he asked, does this include nimble arrays of being, uh, you know, compatible with? And, and Lee, uh, first of all, yeah, you know, we're agnostic to the type of storage down there because we're optimizing there at the OS level. So what's coming out there you, is still a Windows I.O., but you might say it's a it's a optimized Windows I.O. But, Dan, I believe we have some use cases with Nimble Arrays, too, that uh, yeah, no, thank great you. performance. Yeah, we do, GQ, actually, and we have a couple of case studies on our website uh, where the customer had been using, is using Nimble, they then added us into the mix, and they got the best of both worlds. They got the most efficient I/O hitting that Nimble array, and providing the best performance for that Nimble array to deliver to them and their end users. It's really a great story, folks. We're getting the same with Pure Storage. We're getting the same with Nutanix. So, as I mentioned, no matter what the back end is, if, if we can provide the most efficient I.O. for that back end to deal with, it'll all just run faster. Um, so, it's, it's, a, it's really been, a, it really is a great story. Sorry, GQ. No, that's great. And then Chuck asked, can you see any benefit from installing the software on only one VM? or does it have to be installed on all the VMs? And Chuck, uh, it's not required to install on all the 
VMs. You can just install it on your hardest hitting uh, VM. But the reason why we recommend installing it on all the VMs is although you're optimizing the, or reducing the I.O. on one machine, the other machines on that same host are still eating up the bandwidth going down that high price of storage. So by putting it all, you'll get the, the full optimization of it. And then here's one for you, Dan, from Bill. He says, how can you afford to give software away for free? I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> Uh, Bill, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Well, you know, quite frankly, the best, the best test is to put it in your environment and let you run it. Because I could give you examples all day long until you're blue in the face of these incredible results that customers are getting. But actually, every application is different. You know, and there are some that may be extremely write-intensive that don't see the same incredible benefits that one that has a read-intensive uh, application to do. And so because, you know, because of GQ's generosity and for you sitting through the 30 plus minutes here, you know, we decided that, you know, it's at least worth a server, so a single server license to let you kind of dip your toe in the water. But as I said, so that's, that's our, you know, that's our offering to you to try it. As I said, we'd love to work with you to put it on all of the VMs on a host or multiple hosts to let you try it. Um, but again, you know, for your time, we think it's worth us giving that to you. And Bill, no, this, uh, this NFR copy, it does not expire. It's a full license copy. And then uh, Mike asks, how do you figure out the right amount of RAM you should have available for greatest benefits? You know, that, that's a little tough there, Mike. Uh, right now, we'll use what is available or being unused by that system. So if there's a lot on there, we'll be able to use it. If there's not, there isn't. Now, one thing we do tend to look at is, you know, let it run on your system there and then check out the dashboard. If you're not seeing, you know, half the read IOs right there getting reduced, then we would probably suggest looking at adding a little bit more memory in order to get even more uh, advantage of the caching there. Okay. And then, let's see, Patrick, he, he asks, what is the overhead of your software like for memory and CPU usage? Well, Patrick, as, as you know, you saw before on the memory, we're only going to use what's available and not being used. But if a system or user process needs it, we automatically give it up. And if there's no memory available, well, we won't, uh, we won't be able to do any caching there. But we won't, we're not going to go and allocate it from others. And CPU usage, you know, all this uh, data that we go and uh, try to measure, like what, you know, what is the size of the file creation, what data is getting used, we all do that in, at a process running at lowest pred, uh, priority. So it's only going to get run uh, after your normal process priority applications. Well, then, GQ, I'm just going to put another plug in for you and just say GQ has what he just talked about is another patented area uh, in the software called Invisit Tasking, where it uses idle CPU time to do a lot of its jobs. So again, nothing for anybody to do. The software is smart enough to do all of this by itself. And you're right, Dan. You know, besides, you might say we're running at lower than lowest process priority because not only do we are running at that process priority, before we do any processing, we go and check to say, gosh, is there anything using uh, CPUs as an I.O.? Uh, at what level? If it's a too high a level, we'll just say, uh, let's go to sleep and we'll run again later. So we really want to be invisible there. Uh, let's see here. Jay's, Jay asks, uh, does Velocity need a local repository for its data? And uh, Jay, on the caching, 
we're just as a indicate we're just going to use the available uh, memory that's not being used. Now, that said, I will say for each volume, there's probably oh a hundred megabyte data uh, base that gets created. So we kind of keep some data of what data is you know being hit the most. So when if you do a reboot, we can come back up and look at saying you know we know this data is being hit. We should put this in cache. So very little there. Uh, Shu Wen asks, for OLTP or DW type applications, how much performance improvement is expected in general? And how much RAM cache needed in general? And on this one, it, it's, you know, you know, we have seen good improvements from things of this type, like, uh, you know, financial transaction systems and things like that. But I, I've got to be honest with you, it's going to vary with each one because some applications uh, may be more write intensive than read intensive on what it uses there. So it's going to be different. And same thing with the RAM cache. We, in general, we like to see at least be able to have at least four gigabytes of available memory to use uh, to use for caching as a good starting point and see what we can do there. But it will vary on every system. We, you know, we, we, we see some systems that have a half terabyte of memory on their systems, so they have plenty uh, to use. Uh, others, they don't have, you know, they, they have eight gigabytes of RAM on their system, and some four gigabytes, and we get very little from that, but we will use what's available there. And that's why we really say just since now it's so easy to do it, just try us. Just put it on and let it run, let it rip. I, I like this one, Sam. Does it make any difference if the storage is thin provisioned? Uh, no, it doesn't, Sam. Actually, you know, it's, as uh, uh, Dan mentioned before, you know, uh, we're just being known just as a defragmenter before. And defragmenting thin provision storage can make that thin provision grow. So one of the things we've done is by preventing the fragmentation from occurring in the first place is doesn't make that thin provisioning grow. In fact, is uh, several years ago when we uh, introduced, first introduced that technology, I went to some of the uh, storage vendors to make sure that we were fully compatible and they ran their tests on there and, and saw that we were. Uh, Sam has a question that, Dan, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. How is the pricing if installed on a cluster? Sure. So, and, and if I understand that correctly, GQ, and, and keep me honest here. So, again, it's, we have a host license, which covers all the VMs on a host. So you could have 5, 15, 50 VMs on that host, and they're all covered by this one host license, so you would license all of the hosts necessarily in that cluster, which would cover then all the VMs, and would cover, you know, then VMs vMotioning from one to another, et cetera. Okay. And so, so you're saying, Dan, if you buy a host license, you can install it on all the VMs on that host at no extra cost. Absolutely. Yep. That's great. Okay. That was my it's, uh, it's a great it's it's the first time in my life that I've ever asked for a price increase as a sales guy. <laughs> so <laughs> and uh that that was my little marketing part <laughs> on my on my side, Dan. And uh Dave asked, how does this compare to SQL 214 plus buffer pool extension and using SSDs? Now there's two. There's actually two questions on there. One is using SSDs. Uh, you know, the thing is, SSDs will have a, a, a much improved latency rate, of course, compared to hard disk drives. So, uh, reducing those IOs uh, from hard disk drives will give you better performance gains, but you still get the performance gains from SSDs because 
you know, by satisfying it up there on memory, which is usually, what, five, ten times faster than SSDs, we're also preventing that app going down the network there uh, to the SSDs. And as Dan indicated on some of the use cases, we're seeing some great gains on that. Now, to compare it to SQL's 214 buffer pool extension, and that's that's kind of, you know, the, their part of their caching there, too. And uh, it's not, I, I'm not, well, they're not that smart on how what they're using it on. We're much more intelligent on what we're doing for caching. And I have to say this, it's not only the SQL data that we're caching, we're also caching things from the system and from the applications that will also improve your performance there. So, And, uh, and GQ, if I can add my technical side here, remember, it's all these small random writes that degrade performance, right? So it's not the big blobs of data, but it's these thousands and tens of thousands of just these small performance robbing IOs that the intelligent cache that GQ and his team have developed over time learn and they don't leave the server. Yep. Pretty spectacular. And Dan, I got a couple licensing questions here for you. Okay. With the, with the NFR license, this is from Keith. From the NFR license, can I install in a test environment then move to a production server? You know, you sure can, Keith. Yep, you can do that. Okay. And then is NFR licensed per VM? This is from Michael. Yeah, so the NFR, the, you're, the not for resale, hence the NFR, is a, a single server slash VM license. Again, if you'd like to put it on, on a host environment or multiple hosts, cluster, et cetera, we're happy to work with you to do that and give you the software to, do, to, to accomplish that and let you try that. That would be on a, kind of, on a 30 day trial basis, the host based. Okay. And then Derek asks, will there be a noticeable impact in I.O. shown by storage monitors? Good, good question, Derek. And we have many of our customers when they, you know, they'll, they'll look at our dashboard, but they'll use their own benchmarking too. And one of the benchmarks they look at is uh, the amount of IOs going to storage and seeing that being reduced. So, you know, in one case, you, you want to look at IOPS, you know, IOs per second there, and we're actually decreasing it at that level because there's less IO that have to go down there because we're satisfying it there, the reads, and uh, over, so preventing it even have to go into storage, and of course from the rights, you're seeing larger IOs, but less of them are the rights. And then Robert asks, by caching, you are you are adding a delay in writing to disk. How do you uh, account for the increased amount of data not written to disk in the event of a system failure? Ha! Uh, good one, Robert. And actually we are not doing write caching. And because a lot of people think, oh, you must be caching those small writes, buffering them, and then write them in a nice contiguous manner. We're not doing that. All we're doing on, on enforcing nice contiguous writes is we're giving intelligence back to the file system so it, when it writes it out, it doesn't break it up. So it writes it out in a nice contiguous manner. The only caching we're doing is on the read caching. And uh, on the read caching, the data that is in cache is already on the disk. So if something does happen like a system failure, no data in integrity issues because that data is already on uh, the disk. So we, we know data integrity is much more important than uh, performance. So that, that's one of our number one goals there. And then, and I, uh, I apologize if I don't pronounce your name right, Ravikant says, can we use this on a physical host as well and get similar results when the storage is on a SAN? 
I, I love this question here because, you know, we, here we, we've been talking about virtual environments, but the same thing occurs on physical hosts. So look at a physical host. First of all, that I.O. tax is going to occur because it's happening at the Windows OS level on the physical host. Then you have many, you know, usually you have several physical hosts all uh, putting, you know, uh, putting I.O. to a LUN, different LUN, but on the same SAN. So you get that same I.O. tax and the same uh, blender effect going down to the SAN as you do on the virtual side. So good question there. Then Keith says, do you have a VMware module to load on the physical host instead of installing on all VMs? And we do not right now, Keith. Right now, we're installing on the VMs because uh, we want to optimize the I.O. right there where the applications are creating and reading the I.O.s. So we're, we're just on the VMs right now. Then, uh, but similar question here. Sam asks, is it used on both hosts and the SQL servers? Uh, not on the hypervisor hosts, just on the uh, virtual machines. And, you know, you say SQL servers, and, you know, a little bad on our part because on the session we talk about SQL servers and we emphasize it. And we do that because SQL is very I.O. intensive. So that's a sweet spot for our product because anything that's I.O. intensive, we can reduce your I.O. You're going to get great performance gains. But any application or any server type, file server, exchange servers that are I.O. intensive will help on there. Web servers, domain controllers. Yes. Then Rob asks, has your software ever been tested in concert with Unitrans backup. Ah, uh, Dan, you you may help me there. I'm not sure on Unitrans backup. I know we we've, we've had some great success on different types of backups, and this is where we've decreased the window backup uh, for several of our clients uh, with our software, and not just a little bit. In some cases, 3x. Uh, decrease the uh, the window time because they were reaching that. And I think GQ, it, it, wouldn't it apply that again, given that we're sitting in the in the OS optimizing I/O, whatever is backing up the environment, it, it's kind of like again, it doesn't matter what the storage is because we're in the OS optimizing I/O and and caching you know hot reads there. It's just that everything behind then downstream benefits from that and benefits in different ways. And, and you're right, Dan. It's just that some backup tends to work differently on how it, you know, tends to look for data, what to backup, and how it, uh, how it does the backup. So uh, I'm just trying to remember on Unitran uh, there, if we had some cases on there. I just can't remember off the top of my head right now. A good reason to go try it. Yep. Uh, then Keith asks, what about VMs running Linux? And Keith, good question there. And we're, we're getting a lot of uh, questions about supporting Linux. Right now, we're just supporting Windows. And uh, But if we see a lot of demand for this, we will go and support Linux. So good question. And Keith, though, remember, too, if it's a mixed environment, Linux VMs and, and Windows VMs, we're optimizing the Windows VMs, reducing the I.O. on that side. So, you know, customers have seen an overall benefit because we've reduced all of that noisy traffic on the Windows side. Mm -hmm. And then Tyler asks, uh, you talk about the install is non-disruptive for the VM. What is the experience after a trial during the removal of the software? And good, good question, Tyler, because in the previous versions, we did require a reboot to install, complete the install, and when you uninstall, a reboot was required to complete the uninstall. No longer with the current version. 
you install without a reboot, you uninstall without a reboot. So non-disruptive. Then, and unfortunately, then you're potentially your your environment will go back to the way it was performing sluggishly before. <laughs> That's a marketing guy telling you. It's too, <laughs> it's too technically too. <laughs> hey, uh, Albert asked, can I have a copy of this material to share with my team? He says, I like the information to refer to while I am testing the software. Sure, and GQ will be happy to, to send out a copy to everybody. And if anybody would like myself or my counterpart out west to deliver this presentation to a group of folks or other folks, we'd be more than happy to do it for you. Just let us know. Okay. Uh, Sir Harsa says, how, how does it work in physical machines and local drives? Is the same logic applies? And yes, you know, I mentioned that before. Uh, physical machines, even with local drives, you may not have that blender effect, but you still have that Windows I.O. tax effect. So it, it will affect you there, and we will help solve that problem. And Jay, and you answered this, asked, can we get the presentation slides? And yes, Jay, they'll be sent to you. And Daniel asks, is a server reboot required post-install? No, no longer as indicated. No in, uh, reboot is required for install or uninstall the latest version. And, Folks, that's amazing. <laughs> and then Ravi Khan asks, where is a dashboard hosted? This is, uh, there is a, a local, and it's a, it's a browser base. It's hosted right there on the local machine there. Uh, and then, uh, but just to tell you, we do have what is called a velocity management console. When you are talking about, you know, hundreds of deployments and trying to manage it, that we, we are able to provide a single pane of glass where you can deploy it and manage it from one place. Okay. Then Jared asks, what kind of database is created? Now, and Jared, we, as I indicated, we keep a, a small database of our of our cells, uh, but it's an internal, uh, you know, structured database, like uh, you know what data is getting cached, what's uh, what's in there. A lot of that is in the memory itself. So when you uh, when we don't have the memory to use, it goes away though. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. And then Anthony says, I think we answered this, uh, most discussion seems to be for VMs. Can you describe a use case on a large physical SQL server? Wanting to know your experience on multiple terabyte RAM, multi-terabyte database size SQL servers on flash storage. And Dan, you, you may have some use cases on this, but uh, Anthony has indicated before, uh, Although we were talking about virtual machines there, the same issues uh, occur on the physical machines too. Now, on uh, experience with multi-terabyte RAM, yes, we've had, uh, I believe, one, one user with two terabyte RAMs and huge databases. Now, we do limit the amount of RAM we use to 128 gigabytes. That's the most we would limit it if it's available. Uh, so we, we tend to limit ourselves on how much we use there, but we've seen the bigger performance gains on there. And, and you're right, four gigabytes of of RAM on those big databases doesn't help as much. We we do need the, uh, the extra RAM to help on those. But again, uh, too, by using DRAM, 10 to 15 times faster than the flash that you mentioned. So the potential benefit can be significant. Yes. Uh, Patrick asks, how do I obtain the NFR copy? Uh, and Dan, I believe after this seminar uh, session, uh, they'll get emailed on how to uh, Absolutely, GQ. Right? Okay. Yep. Then Lee asks, is IO improvement more read or more write? Uh, it depends, you know, 
what you know what your how your system is you know if if it's more right intensive we'll do those improvements now that said lee i'll be honest with you uh the rights making them more contiguous that does improvement and there's you know less io more reduction there but i will indicate the caching of the read will give you more improvements there just because by caching it we're we're satisfying those reads right there at that OS level. That's preventing that I.O. from having to travel all the way down uh, the network to your storage to get satisfied. And then Pranjal says, can we use Velocity on Microserver 2008 R2? Yes, we, we, su uh, we support uh, that OS. Looking 2008 at, R2 and above, we're all already up to 2016, folks, and going yeah. to 2019. Then Anthony says, looking at scenarios for high-volume ETL report servers, that may be a great scenario for us, Anthony, just because report servers, they tend to do a lot of repetitive reads. So we, you know, get us on there, and I think you'll see some great gains on that. Then Daniel asks, what happens during a power loss event? And I, I think I answered that before. Uh, first of all, our caching is a read-only caching. It's not a write. You know, so uh, with the read caching uh, technology, the data that is in the cache is already on your disk. So if the power loss occurs, you're not losing any data. The data is already on your disk. Uh, storage there. And then Ra Ravikat asks, can we use this on a physical host as well and get similar results when the storage is on a SAN? Uh, yes, you can use it on a physical uh, Windows client. Not the hypervisor, but, uh, but on the physical host itself. And let's see. Oh, well, let's see. Maybe I, I, I did read that one before. Uh, sorry. Uh, any issue? Oh, here, I'm sorry. Harry says, any issues using encrypted file systems? And Harry, no. Uh, that data, we're looking at blocks of data, and it may be encrypted, and we're just satisfying that. It stays encrypted. So we have no problem using encrypted file systems. Uh, Greg asks, does the software require an Internet connection? No, it does not. Uh, the the only thing that, and this is on the help. Uh, when you do help, it will go look and see if there if it can gather help on the on our website, which may be more current. But if it can't, then just use uh, the local help. And Ravika says, so what is required in terms of software for the local host? Now. Uh, now, for the hypervisor host, nothing, because we just get uh, installed on uh, the virtual machines itself. Uh, so nothing, just uh, you'll get the software uh, for uh, a system, and you just install it right on that system itself locally. And as you want to install the other ones, as uh, Dan says, you can get some 30-day trial, 30 trialware installed on the other ones. And as I indicated before, you have a... We have a management console that you can control <coughs> deployment to multiple systems. And IIS, yes, uh, we're fine with that. Oh, uh, you meant hosting the web page for the dashboard. Uh, any, uh, actually, you know, officially we support Internet Explorer, but any other uh, dashboard, Edge, uh, Chrome, all those, We've been working fine on those, too. Okay. Uh, oh, what good will your software do if SQL Server ends up taking 100% of the RAM? And this is from Rustlin. And, guys, I, I know we're going to the top of the hour. You guys got some good questions. I just, I know some of you may drop off, but uh, we just got a few more here and like to answer them all before we do that. Uh, 
you know what? If it's using all 100% of the RAM, you won't get any benefits from our caching technology. From the other technology, uh, the you know, uh, Intellarite and our other technology, you will get the benefits from that. But as we indicated, if you can limit the amount of memory SQL uses, and our our SEs and sales rep can point you to the Microsoft KB article on how to do that. Very simple. Yeah, it is, is the best practice, right, to limit SQL because SQL will eat it all up if you don't. And you may see it may be counterintuitive to you, but by lim by limiting it a bit, letting us us use the extra DRAM, you could get overall better performance. Yes. And, and Larry asks, is there a best practice document available for the product? There is. Uh, there's some uh, documents on how to uh, adjust that memory. Keith asks, any concerns with HIPAA or PCI compliance? No there. And, and the reason I say that is uh, some of our biggest clients are hospitals and medical facilities. Uh, so yeah. nothing there. Yeah, I mentioned Christus earlier. We're on over 2,500 servers there. Cleveland Clinic in Ohio has us on over 2,400 servers. So as GQ said, they're some of our biggest customers. Yes. Wow, this is a great group, Dan. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Uh, uh, Fernando asks, the same host license keys used for all Windows servers under this EXXI. Uh, I'm not, I think he wanted to continue on that. Oh, there is some more. And then let me go back and then two, can the software be deployed to all Windows? Does it need a Windows deployment management server? And Fernando, uh, the license key, I don't think they're not going, it's not going to affect us at all on that. Now the software deployed, it does not need to be deployed on all Windows. It can deploy just on one, or you know, your hardest hitting one. But as we indicated before, we do recommend trying to deploy it all the VMs under a host, just because they're all going through that same hypervisor, and you want to try to minimize the bandwidth from every one of them. Uh, then Fabio has this question: How many, how much resource does the installed monitoring agent consume? Uh, very little there, Fabio, and and the reason for that is, uh, as I indicated, of course, we're running at lowest priority, and then we also have that invisible tasking technology. So, it's only got to be down there running after all your other applications. You'll and hardly see us on Task Manager. Yep. Does the trialware work on physical servers? Yes, it can. And do I need a SQL service account to install and run, or can it work with a local administrator account? Uh, just a local administrator account works fine. Thomas, do you ever recommend to reinstall the application after a guest gets reworked or been on a machine for a long time? Actually, no, Thomas. Uh, this is where it gets a little smarter over time. So. Uh, uh, we just say let it let it run and it gets smart as the time goes on because it gets smarter in terms of determining uh, you know this type of file it usually grows uh, or extends this big or here this is the data that's getting hit the most uh, so over time it's better on that. Harry, does your dashboard application or database? Oops, it just sorry, uh, just scrolled up on me. Does your does your dashboard application or database share any stats or data outside of my uh, company? You have the option on there uh, to send in data so we can uh, and it's it's just you know and, and actually we if you have this option and it's you have to opt in uh, to send in the performance data. And you can look at it before it's sent to us. So you can see there's no, uh, you know, it's nothing on this. Uh, it's just performance, uh, amount of memory being used, uh, how much read IOs, how many write IOs, 
that. But, but the default you, is no. Yeah, you have to opt in on it. Yep. And then uh, how is a uh, just a few more here, uh, Christian? How is a host license manager regards to how the VM guests consume the license? And uh, with that, you know, we're not going to be uh, real stringent on it, but uh, yeah, usually when you start use, using a host license, uh, it goes back and all these VMs go back to this host. Uh, well, they don't go back to the host, but they say, where's this license? Is it to the same host? So it's, it's not too stringent there. And Monsef, uh wants to ask you, Dan, how much does this software cost? I tell you, folks, um, you know, it's cheap at half the price here. But for an example, for the least uh, volume, least discount, the list price, the manufacturer's suggested retail price, these are uh, permanent licenses. It's $3,800 per host license. So that means, you know, 10, 30 VMs on the host, $3,800 one time, and the list price for ongoing maintenance is $950 a year. And again, that's, you know, least amount of discount. And those are list prices. And as you all know, we never pay, or you never pay list price. So think about it, to get 20% performance improvement, let alone folks are seeing 50 to 300% performance improvement for a first year all in of like $4,400, oh my gosh. So I hope that's answered your question. And as we said before, the single VM license is $525 list price. And Dan, looks like I just have one more. This is from Daniel, and you love this. Do you have a referral program for when our private cloud vendor asks, <laughs> how, why our IOPS got cut in half so quickly? <laughs> uh, uh, I love it, Daniel. Give me a call and we can talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'm serious, Daniel, so please. Yeah. That's a good one, but if you're half serious, I'm full serious. <laughs> All right. Uh, to the group out there, that's it on the questions there. This has been one of the best interactive groups we've had, Dan, and I've really enjoyed it. So I want, I want to thank all the participants out there for that. And I too, GQ, thank you, first of all, for doing the yeoman's job, not only during the presentation, but handling all those questions. Uh, you know, great, again, and every time I learn something, so thank you there. And folks, again, thanks for your attendance. You'll get the presentation. You'll get the NFR copy of Velocity Server License. We would love to work with you to expand your trial or test of Velocity across a host or a number of hosts. Install the Velocity Management Console. You'll see so much more data from that even than you see from the individual console we showed you. So please reach out. Let us, let us work with you. We'd love to do it. So again, GQ, thank you. And folks, thanks for your time. Your questions are awesome. And we look forward to talking to you in the near term here. Thanks, right. everybody. Have a great day.